All right, we're back from our break. And here we have our Saxon farm laborers who are, who are working, who would have been in the, they could have been in the churl class. I think I pronounced that wrong. The, um, I, I'm pretty sure this is pronounced churl. And you can see the relationship to the Viking classes of the Carls. The Thanes were a warrior aristocracy, and these would have been equal to the Jarls. But here are some of our, some of our churls, or possibly our thralls, as farm laborers. Ethelred II, the Unready, ruled from 975 to 1016, and he married Emma of Normandy. Now, he married first uh, a woman named Alfgifu, and um, this is so many you can almost spell it <laughs> a dozen different ways. But first he married a woman named Alkafu, and then he married Emma of Normandy. And this is the tie that ties England to Normandy. He ascended the throne as a child, and his nickname was Unread. So we always call him Ethelred Unread, which means Ethelred the readiless, um, the unready. He's called Eth Ethelred the unready. After the murder of his older half-brother, King Edward the Martyr, uh, and was assassinated, and the assassination by Ethelred's men shocked England, although Ethelred himself was blameless. And so his reign started out with bad luck, and it got, it was all downhill from there. Um, there was a split among the aristocracy. Some favored the reforms of Dunstan and Edgar the Peaceable, and others opposed the monastic reform because they had lost land and wealth in the monastic reform. Besides a civil war, a kind of civil war going on among his aristocracy, Ethelred faced renewed Viking invasions of unprecedented force. And he himself was a victim of hopeless circumstances. And here, let's, let's look again at our um, genealogical chart where we can see where Ethelred is. He is right here, Ethelred II, the readiless or the unready. And he married first Alfleda, and then he married Emma of Normandy. And so this is the connection with Normandy through which William the Conqueror gets his claim to, uh, to ruling Normandy. Okay, and here is a portrait of Ethelred right here. Here is the silver coin of Ethelred, and that is his portrait. Uh, C. Warren Hollister has characterized Ethelred in this way. Poor wretch, he held out against the Danes for a long generation, fighting them, bribing them, luring some to his service. Meanwhile, he threaded his way between friends and enemies of monastic reform, attracting to his court strong aristocrats of differing persuasions, issued dooms on ten occasions, maintained close control of coinage, presided over great councils, issued charters through a smoothly functioning royal chancery. In the end, some of his Anglo-Danish no Anglo nobles betrayed him, and the Vikings defeated him. Some modern historians have labeled him a fool, wrongly. Uh, poor Ethelred the Unready, he got bad press in his own time. His own people hated him, and people down to modern times have believed their propaganda against him. He was not a bad king. He was unlucky. He really had the misfortune to have the renewed Viking invasions, and, and they created a crisis that he never overcame. He had to cope with Danish raids of ever greater intensity of a new sort. And now, for the first time among the Danes, you have actual royal armies of conquest. Before, there were largely raiding and trading in very loosely organized expeditions. Now we have royal armies coming to conquer England, and here are some royal Danish soldiers um, ready, to, ready to conquer. But despite English divisiveness and Danish military superiority, 
Ethelred managed to hold out until 991 at the Battle of Malden, and there the Vikings annihilated the East Anglian Ferd. But in 991, Ethelred paid the first Danegeld, and Danegeld is exactly what it says. It's Danish gold, gold paid to the Danes. And if you go through the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and you add up the thousands and thousands of, of uh, coins, they, uh, uh, the amounts would be like 50,000 pounds of gold or 50,000 pounds of silver. And one of the things that immediately raised in my mind was, where did England get all that wealth? If you add up all their paying to the Danes, it was an enormously wealthy country, just incredibly wealthy. And I'm sure that the Vikings had something to do with making England so wealthy, but its wealth is unbelievable. He paid the first Dane Geld in 991, but in 994 the Danes came back, this time led by King Svein of Denmark, the son of Harold Bluetooth. And Harold Bluetooth was one of the first kings of Denmark. The more Ethelred paid Dane Geld, the more the Danes recognized England's wealth and vulnerability, and they would demand more. I mean, they just come back the next year and demand more. In 1009, Svein uh, attacked, and in 1012, Ethelred paid 48,000 pounds of silver. In 1013, uh, Svein came back again, and this time England fell. But in 1014, Svein died, and Ethelred was restored to the throne. He defeated Svein's son, Canute, but in 1016, Ethelred died, and his own son, Edmund Ironside, fought on. But he also died, whereupon the Witan concurred in the accession of King Canute. And so now we have a Viking, a Danish Viking king of England. Okay, now let's turn to the connection between Normandy and England and the interconnection of all these Vikings. So now we're going to start another topic and look at the prelude to conquest. Before I do that, I want to show you this book, which if, if this interests you, The Viking Conquest of England, here's a, a really nice book by Ian Howard, Svein Forkbeard's Invasions and the Danish Conquest of England, 911 to 1017. And let's see if I can get the author on here, Ian Howard. And this is published by Boydell, if you're interested in, in following this up. Okay. What was the year? Uh, the year that this was published, let's see, it's pretty new. Svein Forkbeard's Invasions and the Danish Conquest of England, 991 to 1017. And it was published in 2003. You want to see that one more time? 991. Can you show the author again? It, it is a military history. It's in the series that it's in is a military history series. So probably there's a lot of warfare in this book. So there's a lot of technology. Are, are you pressing your yeah. mic? Yeah. There's good. a lot of technological advance possibly in the. Uh, Denmark at this time, maybe they have superior? No, no, not really. There's no technological advance. The, the advance they make is in their organization. In, in, they build an army, and so they have a real army now uh, for the first time. Before, there were just bands of men, and it was, like, and it was almost like a, a joint venture <laughs> where they would all get a share of everything. Now, this is a different expedition altogether. Uh, the, the only one is going to gain is the king. And so it's a royal army of conquest, and it makes it really quite different. Okay, Ethelred the Unready uh, gets uh, involved in the innovation of the Danegeld, and of course the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle goes crazy. They're so upset. Here he is giving away all the wealth of the country, and the people can't see that he's buying their lives with this money. I mean, that he's keeping the Danes from attacking. Enormous sons in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, C, D, and E especially, 
This was a renewal of attacks after a period of peace under Alfred's sons. First, um, he married Alfgafu, who was a um, who was a, a Danish uh, uh, noblewoman, and then he married Emma of Normandy, the daughter of Duke Richard I and the sister of Duke Richard II, who we talked about last week. Okay, the encomium M.I. Regina is a major source about her because it is written uh, in her honor. Interestingly, um, it, it, it was written as encomium means like a kind of, um, um, what would you call it, a book of praise, a book of praise about her. And, and it's a wonderful source for the Viking history of England, for the Viking kings of England, because of course her husband was King Canute. And um, uh, after, after Ethelred died, she married King Canute. So, so it's really lauds her as the queen of King Canute and not of Ethelred, because he gets more bad press in this book as well. Uh, in 1009, Ethelred may have asked for Norman help against his enemies as he, as, as he married uh, Emma of Normandy. And as far as we can tell, ships were whipping back and forth across the channel. I mean, all the Vikings kept in touch with each other, and they still kept up that heritage of, of uh, living in Normandy and going to England and keeping in touch with all their relatives and all their friends. And so, and so there was lots of contact between um, the Vikings who settled in England and the Vikings who settled in Normandy. Here's a picture of Ethelred with his portrait and here is his coin. You see that a little bit clearer here. And here is Emma as she receives a letter uh, inviting her to marry. Uh, King Ethelred, and here she is in this English church, English ship. She's crossing the channel into England. And here is her home in Normandy, and let's recall some of the d distinctive things about Normandy. One of the most distinctive things about Normandy is the creation of castles, the building of castles, which are, which are a unique um, weapon of war almost and control of the countryside and I'm going to show you a really wonderful castle that's way in the uh, west of Normandy. Uh, this is the castle of uh, uh, Pirot in western Normandy and it's very well preserved and it's just been open to the public. I saw it last summer when I was there. Here's the castle and it's surrounded by a moat for defense so you can see the castle wall and then inside this wall will be the castle buildings. And here's a view of the castle. You can't quite see the moat, but you can see the, uh, the wall around the castle here. And here's another view of the moat, and you can see, uh, oh, and unfortunately, that's an electric cord. That's not medieval, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and here are these castle windows, which are just narrow enough to shoot an arrow through, right? That's what they're for. And, and there are some larger windows, but this one is for defense to shoot arrows through. But you can also see the beautiful countryside of Normandy in these pictures. Here you can see the countryside and going, walking, I was walking around the castle here and of course there were no, there was no glass in the windows in, in Norman days. But here is the drawbridge, that, uh, the, the bridge that goes over the moat and into the castle. And um, these are some of the outbuildings of the castle. And here is walking up the drawbridge and going into the castle. Would that have actually been a drawbridge? That just looks like a no, this is not a drawbridge. Uh, it, it might have or it might not have. This is it's just stone here. Uh, obviously, it's been restored some. Not too much, though, really. Amazingly, it's in, it's in pretty pristine condition. Here's one of those windows looking through to the outside. And uh, you could imagine the archer sitting here and, and firing through the window at the enemies who were attacking. And then this is up at the very top of the castle along the castle wall. And, and this is clearly original. There's the roof of the castle. And, and then it has these small windows, and they have those small slits in them to fire through. And here is one of those slits that you see through and you can see the countryside beyond. 
And then there uh, uh, is the roof of the castle as you see it from, from uh, the, the wall. And, and here is the, the parapet and, um, and uh, standing beside the wall. And here is the view down in the castle yard. And these are the outbuildings. And these are pretty much original, too. These would have been buildings where they kept the animals. And they had the bakehouse. And they had all of the, the weaving and, and the, um, the poultry and the, all of, and the blacksmithing. And all of these things would have been done in these outbuildings around the side of the castle. And here you can see them from, from this perspective, standing on the, on the castle wall. And then you can see the beautiful countryside of Normandy beyond. And here you can see the small, this is actually the small bakehouse and then the, the countryside beyond. And this is one of the most famous monasteries in Normandy. This is Mont Saint-Michel. And I, I luckily found this picture of it, um, which is a very famous monastery, one of the oldest ones in Normandy. It goes all the way back to Carolingian times. So this recalls the land of Normandy that Emma came from. Canute the Great, meanwhile, took over, we, uh, took over England, and he was crowned King of England. And he created a North Sea Empire. The background to him, he, here's another strand that goes into the development of England. He brings with him direct Scandinavian inheritance from Scandinavia. Because remember, the Danes who were in England were there for several hundred years. And now he's bringing a new infusion of Danishness, Scandinavian Viking blood into England. But but the Vikings had developed differently than the English while they were in Scandinavia. So the, the Danish monarchy had been rising. And, and likewise, the Norwegian monarchy and the Swedish monarchy had been rising in Scandinavia at the same time that the English monarchy was growing. Uh, the line of Danish kings is much shorter than the line of English kings. Uh, as far back as we can trace it is to Gorm the Old in, um, in uh, Denmark. And then his son is Harold Bluetooth. And Harold Bluetooth really was instrumental in building a Scandinavian political system. Uh, First of all, he built buildings all over Denmark. He had a huge building campaign, and that implies a system for organizing labor in Denmark. He built structures at Yelling, and there are huge mounds under which he and his father are buried. And there's an early church there, and I'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute. He also reconstructed the Danewerk, which was a, a, a big earthwork kind of barrier that, that was between Germany and Denmark to try to keep the invading Germans out. He built a bridge at Ravening, and he built ring forts everywhere at Furcott and Agersborg and Nonnebacon and Trelleborg. And all of these ring forts became centers of royal power. So we see a different kind of kingship developing in Denmark than we saw in England. And here is a portrait of King Canute, a portrait of King Canute on his coin. And here is the kind of money that the, that, uh, the Danes were collecting in the Dana Geld. Okay, gold coins of all kinds. Here is the uh, famous mound that um, uh, Gorm the Old and Harold Bluetooth were buried under. And this is in, um, this is in Yelling in um, Denmark, and this is the church that he built. It's very much restored, but it's part of this building campaign where he just literally built buildings all over Denmark. Here is the kind of ring fort that he built. This is a model of the ring fort, um, uh, uh, of what a ring fort would look like, and he built these all over Denmark. These are buildings and houses, and so they're always built on a stream, and, and they're circular 
earthworks, um, the buildings in this configuration, and then uh, other houses outside the ring hort, fort. And here is a photograph of Trelleborg. That was actually a model of Trelleborg. And here's a photograph of the actual ring fort. And you can see those earthworks around here where the ring fort is. He also instituted, Harold, this is Harold Bluetooth, also instituted some administrative institutions, dividing Denmark into, into what you would call provinces or counties called sissels, which were very like the English Shire. And so a similar process was going on. Uh, the Herod was a land unit obligated to provide military service to the king. And obviously, this makes you look of a, look, think of a hide, doesn't it? It's the, it's the same kind of a concept. A Herod is a land unit that owes military service to the king. And the Ledding is a national ship levy. And so you see some institutions developing that are kind of like the ones in England. They're quite similar. He also assembled an invading army, and many of the leaders of the warriors mentioned, in, including Olaf Tryggvason and the future Saint Olaf. Olaf Tryggvason, I believe, was a Norwegian, and Saint Olaf was a Swede. So we have a mixed group of warriors, more than just Danes. And many were attracted by the prospect of plunder, and there were many freebooters. Some Irish freebooters were among them, too, and perhaps there were some Normans, too, in this polyglot army of all kinds of different nationalities uh, for the purpose of conquest. And so this is the army that Svein put together. Svein himself visited Rouen, the capital of Normandy, shortly before 1013, and agreed with Duke Richard II that booty taken by the Danes was to be sold through the Normans. And so here we have an example of visitation by uh, Vikings, Scandinavian Vikings, to Normandy, where they were going to actually sell their loot, the proceeds of their raiding. In 1013, then, Svein invaded England with, uh, Canute invaded England with his father, Svein Forkbeard, and the whole kingdom submitted to Svein Forkbeard. Ethelred, at that point, went into exile in Normandy, and Duke Richard II gave him shelter. He took with him his two sons, uh, his son, Edward the Confessor and Edmund Ironsides, and also his daughter, Goda, or Godgefu. Yeah, question. Uh, what did Emma have to say about the fact that the enemy of her husband is visiting her father? with intent to make war upon her and take away her her situation, etc., by driving her husband out. Well, pardon? She'll marry him. Well, later she married Canute. Yeah, she didn't have anything to say about that. I mean, I mean, uh, her father was making these deals. Her husband was desperate, and, and so there she was. But, um, but she was a... She was a very shrewd, clever, political woman. She was a master politician, and she could play the game with the best of those men. And so clearly, uh, one of the reasons she, she married Canute, I mean, she manipulated that deal to marry Canute to help him solidify his power in England. And, and she did it. I mean, clearly, that's the reason. She was 10 years older than Canute, by the way, as well. Yeah. Do you think the Normans at this time were aware of their opportunity coming to, to invade England? Uh, no, I think they weren't. They weren't. But uh, this was something that was done among all the Germanic tribes and all the Scandinavians. They would form marriage alliances with to make allies so that they wouldn't have to go to war and they would have somebody on their side. But, but then it's also quite common among the Vikings to switch sides when it's advantageous to them. And we're going to see some of these Vikings who switch sides as easily as they get out of bed in the morning. And, and this is quite typical of the Vikings to switch sides. And so, and so Emma would just have been left in the lurch if her, if her brother decided to make an alliance with, with Svein Forkbeard. 
that just had to happen. I mean, she had to fend for herself. And these Norman women were really strong in character, as were Viking women. And they could fend for themselves. They could take care of themselves. And, and especially Emma, when you see what she does. <laughs> Okay, well, Ethelred went into exile in Normandy, and he took with him his sons and his daughter, and Richard II, Duke Richard II, gave him shelter. But Spain died in 1014, and so the Witan, which had, which had been forced to accept Spain, then invited Ethelred back, and they expelled Canute, because at that time, Canute was fairly young. He was still in his teens. And so he was pretty young. His father was mature, but they didn't want a teenage king. And they could throw him out. But Ethelred was still unpopular because uh, the, the people didn't like him, uh, mainly because he paid the Dane guilt, and he couldn't stop the Danes from in, in inviting. He had become king under a cloud, if you remember. He had failed to protect his people, and he had spent all this money on the Dane guilt. He had confiscated property as part of the raising the money and so he was viewed as unjust and if you read the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle I mean he really gets bad press in there they didn't like him as king. Canute then waged war against Ethelred's son Edmund Ironsides um, who was who was in England at that time and Wessex submitted to Canute in 1015. Eadric Striona and Thorkel the Tall, who were both Vikings who lived in the Dana law and had been uh, supporters of um, Ethelred, deserted Ethelred at that point and joined Canute. So this, is, uh, this goes on all the time. In fact, Eadric Striona is so notorious, he changed sides about six times going back and forth. Finally, um, finally he was executed. Canute executed him because he couldn't trust him. But, but um, uh, Thorkel the Tall was a little bit more trustworthy. But uh, these two uh, deserted Ethelred and joined Canute with 40 ships. They took 40 of Ethelred's ships with them and joined Canute. How, how would you like to have an army like that under you? When Ethelred died in 23 April, London then elected Edmund Ironside's king, but Canute already had Northumbria. And where is Northumbria? It's up in the north where York is, and York was the center of that Viking power in England from the very beginning. Edmund had some success, so Eadric Striona switched to his side. In 1016, however, Canute recovered the Kingdom of England in October and defeated Edmund Ironside, and Edmund died on 30 November. And at that point, Eadric Striona switched sides to Canute as well. Uh, he's a really interesting character. 1016, uh, 1016 yeah. Uh -huh. And here is, here is the kingdom that Canute eventually ruled. Um, he was already king of Denmark, but Denmark controlled this part of Norway at that time, and so he, he now had England, and he had a North Sea Empire. Look at that. Um, it's almost as if England was going to be turned toward the northern world when Canute was king. Yeah, comment. What kind of uh, acceptance does Canute get in the historiography in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles? Does it get good review? Yeah, yeah, he's treated as if he were a, a legitimate king of England, and he's treated as if he were an Anglo-Saxon king. In fact, it's very odd when you when you go back and you read the historians of England and and um, modern historians in the 19th century, especially, they regarded him as an Anglo-Saxon, and and they didn't even identify him with the Vikings. I mean, they saw him as an Anglo-Saxon. It was it's weird. I wonder if there's a lot of Scandinavian constituency within England by this time. Yes, there was, but it's it's only been in the last 10 years that Englishmen are writing about Anglo-Scandinavian England. They just didn't even recognize that it was so Scandinavian. They considered it Anglo-Saxon from the time of the earliest Angles and Saxons up until the Norman conquest. It's, it's as if they had blinders on. It's quite extraordinary. 
Well, Canute was crowned king, and the evidence for his reign is, is actually very sparse. Uh, we have the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, we have the Encomium M.I. Regina, and I would say the Encomium M.I. Regina is, is probably the, the most um, prolific uh, source of history about Canute's reign. He also issued a law code, the Laws of Canute's, and there are charters because, remember, I've been emphasizing what a written culture this is in England, and the Anglo-Saxon kings issued charters regularly. They, they had written records at their court, and Canute adopted that custom, and he followed the customs of Anglo-Saxon kings. There's also some Icelandic poetry and some of the sagas that we can use as evidence for Canute. The encomium may have been propaganda or praise, but it was written under the Normans, and it's because the Normans were so interested in history, it's quite extraordinary. Emma seemingly wished to forget her marriage to Ethelred, and he doesn't get much play in the encomium at all. It's all about Canute, and Canute is her real husband, according to that. There's a stock description of Canute as a good Christian king, because the first thing he did when he gave, became king of England was to convert. You couldn't have a king of England who was not a Christian, and so he had to be Christian. He is described as defending the weak and exalting justice and suppressing injustice. He's a friend and benefactor of churches. Um, he has laws of Canute, and, and there, is, there are two biographies of Canute. There's one old one written in about 1910, and there's a brand new one by Lawson that, that's written, uh, that's a very good his, uh, story, biography of Canute. Yeah. Is he considered the friend and benefactor of the churches because once he was king, they didn't have to give up any more treasure for the Dane Guild? Well, certainly that's true, but I mean, he was a patron of the churches. He took on the persona of a good Christian king, and, and even though he probably wasn't a Christian, <laughs> I mean, he did put aside his Danish wife. He was already married before he married Emma, and, and he put aside that wife but he kept her as his legitimate wife and he sent her to Norway with their child, with their son, and she became queen of Norway. So he was a bigamist. I mean, it's like he had two wives at once. One was a Norwegian queen and one was his English queen. Yeah. And Emma didn't seem to have a problem with this? Nope. She wanted to be Queen of England. She didn't want to be Queen of Norway. I mean, she, she accepted. And, and so this kind of tells you something about, uh, about um, Normandy as well, that, that Emma would accept this implies that she was not that Christian herself. Did you have a comment? Yeah, it seems like the king has a pretty important status in those times. I mean, the, the office of the king seems to have very high. It does, it does, yeah. And, and, but especially the English are developing this strong concept of kingship. At the very same time, the Scandinavians are developing a strong concept of kingship. How about, is this also part of Christian consciousness also as a king being an important protector of the church or the benefactor? Yeah, absolutely. In my Vikings class, I usually argue that um, one of the reasons that all the Scandinavian countries um, converted to Christianity is because the kings forced them to because they loved the concept <coughs> of the Christian king and the power that kingship gave them. Christian kingship is very powerful, far more powerful. Yeah, and David, yeah, the stories of David and Solomon are, are models that they use. Another model they use is Charlemagne, a model of a strong king. And another model is um, um, the first Christian king of Rome. Constantine, thank you. Constantine, yes. Constantine is one of their best models of kingship. And you know what power a Roman emperor had. And so the Viking kings just ate this up because there, remember, under Germanic tradition, the king is weak. He's elected and he can be deposed. But a Christian king can't be. He's chosen by God. And Roman history is well known. Could you press your button? Yeah. Roman history is well known to these people at this time. 
Yes, because I've been stressing how much they were interested in history, especially the Anglo-Saxons. And when the Normans come to England, there's just this explosion of historical writing. The encomium M.I. Regina is one of those things that, that, that is written at the, under the Normans uh, because there's just such a huge amount of history written. Um, Letters are written on Canute's behalf. I mean, he probably wasn't literate himself, but he pretended to be. And so he had letters written for him. And he issued charters and writs out of his chancery. He adopted all the elements of kingship that we've outlined under Alfred. And so this then would have also transferred back to Scandinavia and have contributed to the growth of Scandinavian kingship. So that's an interactive principle going on here. There are late 11th and early 12th century accounts of Canute's reign in Goscolin of San Bertan and Osborne of Canterbury that are the closest chronologically. In Germany, there's Thetmar of Merseburg and Adam of Bremen. William of Malmesbury is later, but much credit is given to him. He's, he appears knowledgeable about Canute's reign personally, and, and, and virtually nobody agrees with me on this, but I don't trust William of Malmesbury. I think he's quite a propagandist, but um, someday I'll have to write my article on William of Malmesbury, but not everyone agrees with me on that. William of Jumiege is also close. The English churchmen and the nobles elected King Canute and swore fidelity or fealty, and they rejected Ethelred's children, who then went to Normandy, and they were raised at the Norman Duke's count, uh, court. And remember that this would have been actually um, William the Conqueror's father, Robert the Magnificent, raised those children at his court. And then William the Conqueror took care of them, or William the Bastard took care of them when he was young. So he grew up with Edward the Confessor and, and um, Goda, his sister. In return, Canute vowed to be a good lord in matters both church and lay. And remember the coronation oath I read to you from Edgar's reign? Well, he took a coronation oath to swear to be a good Christian king in the same way. It was a pledge supported by oaths of the Danish leaders, and he was elected by the Londoners in, in a kind of gesture as if they were the Witan. He was crowned by Archbishop Liffing of Canterbury, and his first coin shows him wearing a crown. We'll see his first coin in a moment. Canute first married Alfgafu of Northampton, who was the daughter of the alderman Alfhelm. And so Alfgafu was supposed to be, excuse my arm here, I can't get this clip to work. Um, Alfgafu uh, cemented an alliance with the alderman Alfheim and gave him control of the north of England through this alliance. But Alfhelm had been murdered in 1006 by our old friend Eadric Striona. Uh, and so probably um, uh, Canute married uh, uh, Alfgafu to control the surrounding territory. From 1017 to 1018, he collected taxes of 72,000 pounds plus 10,500 pounds from London to pay his army. Now, Canute also made some huge political changes in England. First, he abolished all the E. aldermen. And remember that England was divided up into section, into shires and collections of shires. Well, Canute abolished those, and he divided the country into four parts. So now there are four big earldoms, and the, the title earl is exactly the same as Jarl in Old Norse. The English Earl is the same as Jarl, and so what he did was divide England into four parts and put an Earl or a Jarl over each one of them. He kept Wessex for himself. Um, he gave East Anglia to Thorkel the Tall. He gave Mercia to Eadric Striona, and Northumbria to Earl Eric of Laid, who married Canute's sister Githa. 
and Earl Eric of Lade had been uh, very active in the Orkney Islands as well. And so you can see all of these connections. Um, here are the areas of England that he now divided them into four great parts, which correspond to these. Okay. Here is his first coin, and it shows him wearing a crown. Eric of Lade had ruled Norway also and left Norway in the care of his brother Sweden and his son Haken until Sweden's death in 1015, probably to provide an interim military government. Canute uh, tried to facilitate taxation and reward his followers, control the countryside, and rebellions. Canute lost control of Norway with the death of Eric of Lade's brother Sweden, Sweden and Olaf Haraldsson uh, became king of Norway. Eadric Striona was among the first of the English Vikings to rebel. He was beheaded by Earl Eric of Lade on Christmas 1017, and Ethelward and Britric, other also Vikings, and many others were also executed for rebelling. So, Canute was a harsh king. I mean, he didn't take any nonsense from his followers. And here is uh, our map of Norway and England, which, um, which uh, is part of Canute's territory here. William of Poitiers uh, uh, characterized him this way. Canute cruelly slaughtered the noblest of England's sons, young and old, to ensure his power. He also banished others, uh, Eadwig, king of the Churls, who had led a peasant rebellion, uh, the son of Ethelred's first wife before Emma, uh, and he sent Edward and Edmund, the infant sons of Edmund Ironside, to Sweden to be killed. But the, uh, but the king of Sweden had pity on them and sent them to Hungary, where they were raised. And all of these Viking kings in Sweden and Hungary and Denmark and Norway were all related to each other by marriage. And there was a lot of contact between them. So here are these children who were raised in Hungary and they would return to haunt the English later when they grew up. We'll see them um, in 1066. Suddenly they appear, they come back. Well, Canute married Emma of Normandy, the widow of Ethelred II, probably to prevent her sons Edward and Alfred from gaining Norman military assistance. Perhaps following Canute's agreement with Duke Richard, uh, Edward and Alfred and Godgifu were sent to Normandy. Okay, so they were raised at the Norman court. Canute married his sister, Estrith. Okay, here's another sister he has, Estrith. He married her to Richard's successor, Robert. They didn't stay married very long. Robert actually divorced her. Uh, but it was an attempt to uh, form an alliance with the Normans. Uh, Canute also confirmed the liberties of Canterbury to Archbishop Liffing, and this was traditional for an English king. Canute and his brother Harold joined the, Can the Canterbury Confraternity, uh, and there was a meeting at Oxford between the Danes and the English. Canute, with the advice of his counselors, fully established peace and friendship between the Danes and the English and put an end to all of their forder, former enmity, according to Wolfstan of York. In 1019, Canute sailed for Denmark and stayed all winter, and he may have deposed his uh, brother Harold there, but he added Denmark to Canute's realm for sure. In 1020, he then outlawed Thorkel the Tall on 11 November, and in 1022, Olaf Haraldsson, king of Norway, died, and his son Anand Jacob succeeded. Denmark then came under serious threat, and in 1023, Canute was in Denmark again, making terms with Thorkel the Tall. Canute left him in charge of Denmark and exchanged hostages. They actually exchanged sons. And Bishop uh, Gerbrand of Roskilde in Denmark accompanied Canute back to England. 
and here we have Scandinavia and the shaking up of the Scandinavian kingdoms. Canute made Gerbrand Bishop of Zealand in, um, in Denmark. And Emma and Hartha Canute, Hartha Canute was the son of Emma and Canute, accompanied the relics of St. Alfie from Rochester to Canterbury. In 1025, Canute went to Denmark where he fought in the Battle of Holy River and was defeated probably by Annan Jacob of Sweden and Olaf of, Norman, of Norway. In 1026, Richard II, Duke of Normandy, died and was succeeded first by Richard III, his son, who died very quickly, and then by Robert the Magnificent, who was the brother of Richard III. Duke Robert married and divorced Canute's sister Estrith. We've mentioned her before. And Robert treated the Aethlings Edward and Alfred with great honor, adopting them as brothers, suggesting that he was not cooperating with Canute and that he was actually challenging the power of Canute. Now this may be the point where the Normans thought about their connection to England and the possibility of getting England. It's just, it's a, it's a possibility. We, there's no record that they thought about it. But by divorcing Estrith, he was making a statement. <laughs> okay. He demanded, Robert demanded that Canute restore Edward and Alfred to their kingship. Okay. And here we have, um, here we have the Dukes of Normandy again. Here's, here is Richard II, who is the Richard III, who is son of Richard II, and Robert is his brother and becomes Duke, and Robert is actually the father of William the Conqueror. And here is Canute married to Emma over here. In 1027, Canute was present at the imperial coronation of the Emperor Conrad II of Germany, uh, and this coronation took place in Rome on 26th of March. Uh, Canute at that time was preparing to overthrow Olaf of Norway and may well have been trying to solicit the, the alliance with the Emperor Conrad of Germany. And at this point, he already claimed Olaf's throne, and Canute called himself king of all England, Denmark, the Norwegians, and some part of Sweden. So here is an emperor. He's portraying himself as an emperor, and he's going to the court of Conrad, the Holy Roman Emperor, one emperor to another. He's got grand ambitions here. But he returned to England before launching his attack on his fellow Scandinavians. In 1028, he sailed from England to Norway with 50 ships and drove Olaf away. Eric of Lade's son, Hakon, was with Canute and he paid off Olaf's men. Canute then put Norway under Earl Hakon's control and entrusted Denmark to one of his sons. Here is uh, the Holy Roman Empire. At that time, the emperor claimed all of Germany here, plus Switzerland and part of northern Italy. He actually claimed all of Italy, but that's the only part he really controlled. And here is one of the um, Holy Roman Emperors of Germany. And you see him seated on his throne with his men around him and very much elevated. And here are the countries of Germany doing homage to him, um, Bavaria and Germany and France and Rome. And, and these are all the countries of Europe doing homage to the uh, uh, king of Germany, the emperor of Germany. And this is, this is what Canute envisioned for himself as being emperor of the northern world. In 1028, Canute returned to England, and Earl Hakon unfortunately drowned at, at sea. Olaf returned to Norway, and then in 1029, we have the Great Battle of Stickelstad, where all these kings uh, go to war together, and Olaf, king of Norway, was killed and became Saint Olaf. At that point, an instant saint and martyr, even though it was a political battle, the, uh, <laughs> the Danish church interpreted it as a Christian martyrdom um, for some reason. 
Well, then Canute put his first wife, Alfgafu of Northampton and son Swegen in charge of Norway. At this point, Canute's power equaled Svein Forkbeard's in 1013, and he had a North Sea empire founded on political, military, administrative, and diplomatic skill. Canute adopted a crown now modeled on the crown of the German emperors, and he had good relations with the Emperor Conrad II. He betrothed his daughter, Gunhilda, to Conrad's son, Henry. So again, a marriage alliance to cement his power. And here are all the lands that Canute ruled at this time. In 1031, Canute went to Scotland and received the submission of three kings, just like Ethelstan had. Do you remember when Ethelstan received the commission, the submission of the kings of Scotland? Now he was following that tradition. I mean, he really had imperial ambitions. He took, he, he, he took the fealty of Malcolm II, Macbeth, uh, Eckmark Ragnelson, the kings of Scotland, Moray Firth and Sutherland, and Galloway and Man. And the latter, um, uh, Eckmark Ragnelson, became the king of Dublin in 1036. So what he's saying is, he's also the emperor over Scotland and Ireland and the Isle of Man and, um, and the whole territory of Scotland. So he's, he's really seeing himself as an emperor. Yeah. This is quite unique in, in English history, isn't it? I mean, other English kings have been more English or British later, but... Well, wait till you see what the Normans do. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the, Normans, the Normans do something similar. I mean, but here he has this imperial concept of himself. But remember that Ethelstan had a, an imperial concept of himself modeled on Charlemagne. And, and in fact, the German emperor, Conrad, sees himself as a continuator of Charlemagne's empire also. So, I mean, they're, they're ultimately, they're looking at Charlemagne as their models. But, I mean, here is Canute seeing himself a, as the most Christian emperor, not just a king, but an emperor of the northern world. This is very extraordinary. There is evidence of Canute's activities in Ireland and Wales also. King Citric Silkbeard modeled his coins after Canute's and may have witnessed three of Canute's charters. That means he went from Ireland to uh, the court of Canute and attended his court and signed charters there. Archbishop Athelnoth of Canterbury consecrated the first bishop of Dublin. And so uh, we're seeing uh, this is a symbol that the Church of England has control over the Church of, of Ireland. This seems like a rise of Christendom in a way. I mean, this is part of the Christian kingdom. Yes, because of the concept of Christian kingship, he has to support the church and he is enlisting the church's aid in building what he sees as an empire here in the North Sea. So by extending the power of the Church of Canterbury, it also extends the power of, of, of his royal power. And we've already seen how allied together the English kings are with the church in England. So he's using the church in the same way that the English kings had used it. Bishop Joseph of Landaff may also have been consecrated by Ethelnoth of Canterbury. So Landaff is in Wales. And so it's an assertion of English power over Wales and Ireland by, by doing these consecration. The Encomnias names Canute's dominions as England, Denmark, Norway, Britannia, and Scotia. That includes the entire British Isles. In 1033, Duke Robert of Normandy assembled a fleet to invade England and restore Edward to the throne. Okay, he's declaring uh, the, the Normans on the side of Emma's first children uh, by her first husband. Canute then offered to restore half of England and establish peace. And Edward then witnessed grants to Mont Saint-Michel and Fécamp, two of the famous abbeys of uh, Normandy, as king of the English. So there is this hint 
that um, that maybe Canute would share his power. I wouldn't trust him, though. I mean, I don't see why anyone would trust him. But anyway, Edward was wise enough not to actually go to England. <laughs> he stayed in Normandy. Godgifu, or Goda, Edward's sister, married and sometime Drew, or Drogo, Count of the Vexan. And she had uh, three children, three sons, by Drogo, Count of the Vexan. And then he apparently died because then later on she was free to remarry. In 1035, Gunhilda was betrothed to King Henry III of Germany, and so Gunhilda, remember, was the daughter of Canute, and so one emperor is betrothing his daughter to another, and so this is the statement he's making. In 1036, the marriage actually took place, and Henry waived his rights to the Danish duchy of Schleswig as part of the bargain. At this point, in 1035, Duke Robert set out for a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and he died on the way back, as you recall. And here are all the lands that Canute claimed. Now he claims that he's king of all the British Isles, as well as Norway and Sweden, building his empire. In 1035, though, Canute died also on 12 November, and Edward who was still in Normandy, was poised to set sail for England, and he defeated a large English force at Southampton. Meanwhile, his brother Alfred sailed from Wissant, which is, which is really in Flanders, across to Dover, and there Earl Godwin, who was one of um, the chief uh, Viking lieutenants of uh, uh, Canute betrayed him to his death, and so he was he was killed surreptitiously while being offered the protection of Godwin. And once Edward heard that his brother Alfred had been murdered, Edward turned back and realized that he did not have enough troops. At this point, who was going to succeed in England? Edward didn't make it. He tried to invade and he couldn't make it. So Harder Canute, the son of Canute and Emma, at age 17 was king of Denmark. But when Emma married Canute, she made him swear on a stack of Bibles that their son would inherit England. Now this oath is broken. Their son is preoccupied with being king of Denmark. So Sweden. Canute's eldest son is king of Norway with his mother Alkavu of Northampton. Uh, he died in 1034 after expulsion by Magnus Ol Olafsson. So the only son left was Harold Harefoot, who was the son of Canute and Alkavu. He was the second son. Sweden was the eldest son, and Harold Harefoot was the second son. He's the only one left to succeed in England. So he came to England and tried to become king, but Hartha Canute's supporters, and Earl Godwin especially, challenged his right to be king. And after a tumultuous kingship, and, and here is, this is actually Alfred being welcomed to England and then murdered. <sighs> and Emma also supports the rule of Hartha Canute. She allies herself with Earl Godwin and they try to get Hartha Canute on the throne. Um, he is accepted at first as regent and recognized as co-king with, uh, with Harold Harefoot. Harold Harefoot mysteriously dies after only two years. Hartha Canute becomes king, and, and they're both just young boys, and Hartha Canute dies mysteriously after two years, and we don't know why they die. I mean, there, there's no story that tells why they die. They just die. <laughs> yeah, come it's in. Sounding like Roman history now. It is, it is. I mean, it sounds like, you know, dirty work afoot. Um, but he was accepted, Hartha Canute was accepted at first as regent, but the encomium reports that Archbishop Athelnoth refused to crown him. Now, meanwhile, Canute had created a really terrible situation in England. He had created a lot of powerful earls 
and most of them were Danes. Remember that he had divided England into four huge earldoms. And, and so the Danes were, the, the, the Danish earls were able to build for themselves a large territorial power base in each of their earldoms. And uh, other than the creation of earldoms, he ruled in the Anglo-Saxon tradition. He had become Christian and respected Anglo-Saxon customs, issued dooms, and so on. Uh, and, and by and large, the people of England liked him. Uh, Mary sang the monks of Ely as Canute the king rode by, according to the Anglo-Saxon chronicle. And here are the great earldoms that he created. And here is the trade that's created with the continent. Okay. And here is Alfred being welcomed to England and then surreptitiously murdered. And here is the crowning, actually, of Edward as king, um, eventually. And here is Edward as king of England. Eventually, he becomes king. Um, Canute was obliged to delegate authority to the four large earldoms, Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, and Wessex, ruled by earls or yards. Jarls, and this Godwin of Wessex was the most powerful. Canute also had a herd at his court. Um, a herd is a collection of, it's his bodyguard. The bodyguard, uh, the Scandinavian bodyguard is called a herd. In, in, in the English court, they're called house carls. The hundred courts and the shire courts continued, and towns grew and prospered, and there was increased North Sea commerce, and that's what that green map was a while ago. In 1036, the eighthling Alfred, Edward the Confessor's brother, was murdered, and Godwin was probably to blame. In 1040, Harold Harefoot died after ruling only four years. In 1040 to 1042, Hartha Canute died after ruling only two years. He ruled from 1040 to 1042. And it was in 1042 that Edward the Confessor became King of England. And so uh, we've just seen... Professor? Yes, a uh -huh, question? Yes, I was wondering, uh, Harold Harefoot, who, was, who were his parents again? Okay, Her uh, I know this is very confusing. <laughs> Harold Harefoot was the second son of Alfgafu and Canute, and Alfgafu of Northampton was Canute's first wife. Okay, she was English. And then, and then, uh, Hart the Canute was whose? Hart the Canute. You said Harold. Right. Harold Harefoot is the is the second son of Canute and his Nor Norway wife. Right. And then Hartha Canute is the son of who? Of Canute and Emma, his Norman wife. Okay. So he was the guy that was preoccupied in Denmark? Yeah, right. As, mm -hmm. as the king at 17? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. People grew okay. up it's fast in those days. <laughs> People grew up fast in those days. Well, in 1042, Edward the Confessor actually did become king of England. And here he is, as here is England at the time of the Norman Conquest in 1066. Um, in 1043, Edward the Confessor was crowned, and Edward brought a lot of Normans with him. Uh, most uh, importantly, Robert of Jumiege. Robert of Jumiege was, had, had formerly been a monk of the Abbey of Jumiege in Normandy, and he was made the Bishop of London. The other really important Norman that he brought was Ralph, Earl of Hereford, and his vassals. And so one of the things that, um, that Edward the Confessor was trying to do was to bring these Normans as allies to help him and support him. Emma and Godwin had made a deal. Edward the Confessor was going to be uh, the King of England, and Edward was going to marry Edith Godwin's daughter. The daughter of Godwin would be married to Edward the Confessor. And together they would withstand the threatened invasion of England by Magnus, King of Norway, who also claimed the English throne. All right, everybody's claiming the English throne. English government is now going to be a mess. 
Oh, but Magnus died suddenly on 25 October, and once the threat was gone and Edward no longer needed the support of the Godwins, he immediately banished Emma to Flanders. He exiled her. He sent her out of the country. Is that any way to treat your mother? Yeah, <laughs> yeah? why do you think? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I was just thinking, she's, she could care less about her other kids that have been over there for You're however right. long. And then, <laughs> and then I'm thinking, how stupid is he if he marries the daughter of the man who killed his brother exactly. or something? So, exactly. good, throw her out. Yeah. Boot her away. Well, he must have been forced. He must have been forced to marry her, which is what I think, that he was forced to marry Godwin's daughter. And here is his mother making a deal with the man who killed his brother. And, and so, and she deserted her children. I mean, she sent them to Normandy to grow up and, and married some, their enemy. <laughs> so, I mean, what kind of a mother was she? And, and so, I don't blame him for banishing Professor? her. Uh-huh, question. She may have sent her sons over to Normandy because they were in danger of being killed. Wouldn't that make sense? I mean, Canute would have would have killed him, wouldn't he? You're right. That's a good point. That's a very good point. He 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 would have killed them. Yeah, because as soon as they came to England, they were killed. And and in fact, he sent the Anglo-Saxon royal line to Sweden to be killed. Remember, and they were sent to Hungary. Yeah. Question. Well, that's probably one of the reasons that she also married Canute. I mean, yes, it's power for her, but you know, in a way, it's also keeping her whole family alive because if she didn't marry him chances are because of any claim that her or her children could have had her life was at risk as well that's an excellent point as well and, but it also assured her continuation as queen of england which was a nice thing to be <laughs> well i'm not saying she was entirely unselfish <laughs> in the in the process but you know it was also probably a lot of you know consideration as to what would be best for her family as well that's a good point. And, and so, but, well, on the other hand, the children were already in Normandy because she had been in Normandy. Remember when Ethelstan went to Normandy, that's when the children, I mean, Ethel, Ethelred went to Normandy, that's when the children went to Normandy. She went with them. Now, it, it, um, it, it's very telling that he didn't send her to Normandy. Uh, when he when he banished her, he sent her to Flanders, and what role Flanders is is playing in all of this is, is something nobody's really looked at before. Why did she go to Flanders? She was welcomed there. She was treated as an honored guest. This is very interesting, and and nobody's ever really written about that and and, and tried to analyze why she was treated that way in Flanders. Because we're going to see some more connections with Flanders. Who did William the Conqueror marry? Does anybody remember who he who he married? Right. Matilda of Flanders, that's who he married. And so the Count of Flanders has his finger in the pie as well. Something's going on here. But we'll see some more. Here's the coronation of Edward, the confessor. And here is his seal. This shows him as king, uh, the seal of King Edward. Edward Rex Anglorum, or Basilii. Yeah. Godwin, meanwhile, increased the size of his kingdom to include Cornwall, Sussex, and Kent. Uh, Earl Godwin then amassed the largest earldom in all of England, and he actually controlled more land than, Edward, than King Edward did in England. He placed his several sons in most of the other earldoms so that Godwin and his sons controlled most of England under Edward the Confessor. And remember that Edward was married to Godwin's daughter. It looks to me like he's surrounded by his enemies. The in the crucial year 1051, in January, Robert of Jumiege, Bishop of London becomes Archbishop of Canterbury. In 26 March, the Count of Maine dies and Le Mans surrenders to the Count of Anjou. 
in that year of 1051, there's an unsuccessful rebellion by Earl Godwin and his sons against Edward. And it's kind of set off by Eustace of Boulogne, who seems to have colluded with Edward. And the Godwins were all sent from England into exile in Flanders. And the reason Eustace of Boulogne claimed some land in Dover and the Godwins then attacked him for it and Eustace appealed to the king and said, your vassals are attacking me and I'm your ally. And Eustace had then married his sister Goda who had, her first husband had died and now he was married to Goda. And um, I'm going to show you where Boulogne is. Boulogne is just south of Flanders. It's between Normandy and Flanders. And so Eustace of Boulogne is going to turn out to be a major player in the conquest of England. Well, with the collusion of Eustace of Boulogne and, um, and Edward the Confessor, the king, the Godwins are all sent from England and they go to exile where? To Flanders. They go to Flanders in exile. Yeah. Flanders is sort of like a Siberia at that time, maybe because of the marshlands? No, Flanders is a wonderful place, and the Count of Flanders is the most, one of the most powerful lords in all of England. He's more, all of France, he's more powerful than uh, the King of France himself. And so he's a very powerful and rich man. Uh, and, and so uh, here are all these Vikings going to Flanders. But remember when we looked at the first Viking invasions? Where did they set up their kingdoms? In Flanders. Remember that we have a lot of Vikings in Flanders. And in fact, the counts of Flanders are descended from Vikings. So all these Vikings are hooked together. So here is now England with all these earldoms that are now under the control of the Godwins. Eustace of Boulogne, as I said, married Goda, who's also known as Godgifu, the sister of Edward the Confessor. And Boulogne and Flanders were rival powers in the area of Frisia. Flanders and Boulogne are both in Frisia. And the Count of Flanders actually claims um, sovereignty over the Count of Boulogne, except that the Count of Boulogne was too powerful for the Count of Flanders to, to subject him. Edward promised William the Bastard of Normandy the succession to the Kingdom of England at that time in the crucial year 1051. And in summer to February of 1052, there was warfare between William and the Count of Anjou around Domfront and Alençon because William the Conqueror claimed Maine. And remember that the Count of Anjou had grabbed Maine. William the Bastard then, in this very year, 1051, married Matilda, the daughter of Baldwin V of Flanders. All these Vikings are shifting alliances here. Now we're in the crucial year, 1052. In summer, there's an outbreak of rebellion in Normandy by William Count of Arc. And on 15 August, the Count of Anjou allies himself with the King of France against the Normans. Okay, and here are these counties. Here is Normandy. Here is Boulogne. Here is Flanders. And this is the County of Maine, the County of Brittany, and the County of Angers. Now, the County Count of Anjou has now control of Maine. The Normans have control or they claim control of Brittany. So they're, they're rivaling yes, themselves over France. Yes. On that map that, on that page that you just flipped back? Yeah. The, where is the William of Arc? Oh, William of Arc, he's, he's a Norman. I don't know where he is. I can't find him on that map, and, but he's, it's an internal, internal rebellion in Normandy by William of Arc. Oh, okay. And here you can see on this larger map the relationships that we're talking about. Here is Normandy, here is Brittany, here is Maine, here is Anjou, here is Boulogne, here is Flanders, and this is actually, I don't remember what this is over here. Wait, this is Boulogne. This is Boulogne and this is Flanders. I don't know what that orange is. 
In August, Earl Godwin and his sons Harold and Leofwine returned to England by force. This is in uh, 1052. And they intimidated Edward. They, they came with a whole army and they intimidated Edward into surrendering to their power. They're reestablished in their earldoms. And at that point, they threw out all those Normans in England. They made them return to Normandy, including Robert of Jumiege, who was the rightful Archbishop of Canterbury. And then they appointed a Viking Archbishop of Canterbury, Stigand. This will have repercussions later. In 1053, on the 13th of April, Earl Godwin died. And in June, other events were taking place in the world. In Italy, the Italian Normans defeated the army of Pope Nicholas II. And that would have repercussions, which we'll get to later. In November or December, William the Bastard captured Ark, and in December to January 1054, King Henry of France invaded Ivru while his brother Odo invaded eastern Normandy. 1053, at the Battle of Mortimer, uh, he, he defeated, William defeated the King of France and held an ecclesiastical council at Lisieux. At this point, William allied himself with the papacy and the Reformed Church because he deposed his brother, Maguire, as Archbishop of Rouen and appointed Morilius, who was an Italian reformer. At this point, our old friend Lanfranc, remember he was the abbot of Bec, or he was the abbot of Caen and a monk of Bec, he be, becomes the reformer who has control of the Norman church. In 1054, Earl Seward of Northumbria died. He was virtually the only Earl who was not a Godwin. In 1055, Robert, William's half-brother, became Count of Mortain, and he would become very powerful. In 1056, King Henry I of France and the Count of Anjou became allies once again. Henry in, uh, King Henry invaded Normandy, and at the Battle of Vereville, he was defeated. The eighthling Edward, son of Edmund Ironsides, at this point returned to England from Hungary with his children, Margaret, Edgar, and Christina, and died shortly after his arrival. And so at this point, we know that they have come back because they can lay claim to the kingdom of England. All these people are claiming the throne. And here are these places in Normandy that we were talking about. Here is William the Bastard, who is poised to claim Normandy. And we won't go through these last dates, but because um, we're out of time. But next time, we'll take up the conquest of England.